Okay. And one more. Yes. You're about to hear a set of loudspeaker specifications. Now that's unusual, but at JBL we think it's time for a change. That's why we're here in the studio making this record. Remember that the function of a high fidelity loudspeaker is to reproduce recorded music. A good loudspeaker will reproduce music with clarity, detail, separation, and definition. And these are qualities that can't be reduced to a set of tabulated numbers on a piece of paper. That's why some of our friends got together with us at Capitol Records to make an album that you could use as a standard of reference. We'll take each of the selections on this record apart and let you hear each instrument individually. Then we'll put them back together again so that you can make a valid comparison between loudspeakers. As you will hear on sides three and four of this album, the sound of a record depends greatly on the monitor loudspeakers used in the studio. Most of today's records are monitored on JBL loudspeakers, just as this one was. Please listen to this music on our speakers to see how we intended it to sound, then listen on any other speakers. After making your comparisons, we think you'll prefer our products for exactly the same reasons most of the major studios in the world prefer them, clarity and definition. However, if you find that someone else's product is more to your liking, we'd like to think of it this way. We've provided a basis for comparison, you've made the choice that pleased you most, and we've contributed to your pleasure. Now let's play the instruments in this selection. There are three acoustic bass parts. Here's one of them. Now here's a six-string guitar. And a 12-string guitar. And a bowed bass. Believe it or not, that was a bass too. It was plucked with a pick. Now that very high-pitched sound you hear is the third bass part. It's a harmonic played on an open D string. Now here come the drums. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? Let's play it back from the beginning.
took it. Today's country rock music can provide a challenge for any loudspeaker. The mid-range energy is enormous, and the instrumentation is highly complex. The music depends upon definition of individual instruments for its artistic effect. Now, this tune is really a prime example. It has two rhythm guitar parts, two dobro guitar parts, a banjo, and percussion, of course. as well as a vocal. The old folks say they know me and somebody ought to show me what a fool I am and tear my playhouse down. But for all the times that it's been tried, I ain't never quit, I ain't never cried and I ain't got no intention of starting now. It also has a pop guitar, a steel guitar, two electric guitars, a harmonica, six girls singing background chorus, and the vocalist singing harmony with himself. Now that you're acquainted with this problem and definition, let's start again from the top. See how many individual instruments you can hear. She went down to the Union Station and bought herself a ticket on the last train headed for Moline. She called her mama on the phone, she cried and begged to go back home, but I'm too drunk to know just what that means. Maybe she's gone for good or just a week, maybe I'm too weak. Or too proud to speak But the truth is I'm a spirit from another place and time And sometimes I'm all together And sometimes I stumble blindly Down the path of least resistance At the solitary insistence Of the devil on my shoulder The old folks say they know me And somebody ought to show me What a fool I am and tear my playhouse down But for all the times that it's been tried I ain't never quit, I ain't never cried And I ain't got no intention of starting now Maybe she's gone for good or just a week Maybe I'm too weak or too proud to speak But the truth is I'm a spirit From another place in time And sometimes I'm all together And sometimes I stumble blindly Down the path of least resistance At the solitary insistence Of the devil on my shoulder Sometimes I'm all together, 
I sometimes I stumble blindly down the path of least resistance At the solitary insistence of the devil on my shoulder But the truth is I'm a spirit from another place in town Sometimes I'm all together Sometimes I stumble blindly down the path of the least resistance at the solitary insistence of the devil on my The harpsichord is rich in harmonic content. The instrument you just heard is a nine-foot harpsichord, and very few loudspeakers can reproduce it without coloration. Let's play it for you again. Another very difficult instrument to reproduce properly is the human voice. Listen. You might have said it's time to go. At least I thought you did. But I don't see why you'd say that now. This selection illustrates both instruments very well. Most loudspeakers will make the harpsichord harsh and the vocal strained with no breath tones. Let's play it for you from the top and you can see what we mean. And I 
We had a lot of fun making this record, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Thank you. Have a nice day. On side one of this album, we said you were going to hear a set of loudspeaker specifications. We feel this is necessary because most manufacturers, other than JBL, provide specifications such as frequency response for their products, but provide no means to relate those numbers to the sounds inherent in music. 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is the theoretical ideal, and most specifications come as close to that as corporate consciences will permit. But the ideal bears little relationship to recorded music, and after all, records are the reason you buy loudspeakers. Let's talk for a moment about the frequencies found on records. Maybe we can illustrate the real requirements for a loudspeaker at the same time. We're going to play a very low frequency tone. Try to guess the frequency. This actually is 70 hertz, very close to C sharp. We chose this frequency for two reasons. First, we wanted to illustrate that what most persons perceive as low frequencies are actually much higher than they realize. Secondly, many records contain no musical notes below this frequency. These lower notes are filtered out of the master tape as the record is cut, because low frequencies require a much wider record groove. Lots of wide record grooves would therefore reduce the amount of playing time on each side. The compromise that most record companies use is 50 hertz. This will permit a fatter sound while still providing an acceptable playing time. This is what 50 hertz sounds like. Very few loudspeakers will reproduce even this frequency at a reasonable listening level without doubling. When a loudspeaker doubles, it is producing the second harmonic as loud or perhaps louder than the fundamental. In that case, a loudspeaker being driven by 50 hertz would actually reproduce 100 hertz. We'll play that 50 hertz tone and then switch to 100 hertz. If you don't hear a substantial change, the speaker is not reproducing accurately. We'll repeat the change twice, so you can compare loudspeakers. Here we go. And again. Record companies make this compromise because very few notes in music are below 50 hertz. Few commonly used instruments even produce them, the bass and the piano. The lowest fundamental of the bass is about 42 hertz, depending on tuning. Here is 42 hertz. At the other end of the spectrum, the highest fundamental commonly heard is the piano at 4,186 hertz. Above that, music is made up of harmonics. However, a piano playing a given note and a guitar playing the same note sound different because they produce a different harmonic structure from that note. The harmonic content determines the sound of the instrument and thus is important to definition. Obviously, we should reproduce as many harmonics as possible, and this would imply higher and higher frequencies. However, let's consider the recording process and reality again. Recording engineers agree that recorded frequencies above 15,000 hertz are mostly tape hiss and contribute little, if anything, to the music. As a matter of fact, professional tape machines used in studios only specify performance to 15,000 hertz. Very few persons can hear higher than this, and almost no phono cartridge will reproduce it except under laboratory conditions. We'll do a frequency sweep for you. We'll start at 20,000 hertz and gradually lower the frequency till we reach 10,000 hertz. Note the point at which you begin to hear the tone. 20,000, 19,000, 18,000, 17,000, 16,000, 15,000, 14,000, 13,000, 12,000, 11,000, 10,000. 
We should point out that we used state-of-the-art recording techniques including Dolby A and 30 inches per second recording speed. Therefore, the following test should be useful. The violin probably is more sensitive to high frequency response than any other instrument. To illustrate the relative contribution of high frequencies to music, we're going to play a violin for you. About halfway through, we'll filter out all the frequencies above 15,000 hertz. See if you can spot the change. Now we'll play it again and filter out all the frequencies above 12,000 hertz. Listen carefully. Now we'll repeat the same test at 10,000 hertz. The point of this demonstration is that frequency response flat to about 15,000 hertz is necessary to the proper reproduction of music. Response to 20 or 25,000 or even more, even if it is really achieved consistently in production, is interesting but academic insofar as music reproduction is concerned. In any case, the real test of speaker performance is enlightened listening to recorded music. On side one, we played individual instruments for you, then blended them into the complete tune so you could listen for definition. Another equally important criterion for speaker performance is freedom from coloration. Coloration may be caused by resonances in the enclosure, poor crossover network design, or strong erratic peaks in frequency response. Since these occur at discrete points in the frequency spectrum, they can be masked when an entire band is playing. The rest of this side is devoted to playing solo instruments for you so that you can compare loudspeakers for susceptibility to coloration. Like definition, coloration can't be described by a set of tabulated specifications. Let's begin with a drum set. Listen for an explosive live sound. The snare should be crisp and the cymbals should ring. If they become harsh or flat, the speaker's high frequency response is peaky or distorted. an electric bass. You'll also hear a foot drum because the two usually play together.
Here's a 12-string guitar. It should be crisp and metallic. If it becomes harsh, the tweeters have sharp peaks or poor transient response. Our piano is recorded with two microphones located inside the case, close to the strings. You should be able to hear the attack of the hammers on the strings. Here's an acoustic bass played pizzicato. Listen for a sense of pitch on the low notes and a fat, woody sound. A flabby or boomy sound, no matter how pronounced, means the speaker is doubling or suffering from poor transient response.
the acoustic bass is also played with a bow. On this passage, you should be able to hear that same sense of pitch and at the same time, almost feel the rosin on the bowstrings. The cello should sound rich and open. This instrument will make many speaker enclosures resonate, thus coloring the sound. The viola should sound warm. Again, the rosin on the bowstrings should be almost a tactile sensation. The violin should sound taut. A tweeter with peaks in the response will produce a metallic sound. The timpani produce subsonic frequencies with explosive impact. A speaker with poor transient response will make them sound thin.
The bass flute should sound mellow and smooth with clear breath tones, which will be masked by many speakers. Now we'll play an alto flute for you. Listen for those breath sounds again. The oboe is a severe test of crossover design. The quality of the instrument should change on certain notes. If it sounds the same all the way through, the crossover is badly designed. Now we'll play some English horns. You should be able to hear the rasp on each note that is peculiar to the English horn. We hope that sides one and two of this album have provided you with the means to usefully interpret some common loudspeaker specifications and to compare them with the actual performance of the product they describe. Also, hopefully, you are now able to establish some enlightened criteria of your own that no specification can describe. Definition and coloration. The JBL dealer who provided this album is interested in helping you get the loudspeaker that you'll be most happy with, even if it isn't JBL. Oddly enough, so are we. Enjoy. You're getting to sound like a drum. <laughs> oh, Captain America. Oh, far out. Most persons never have a chance to get into a recording studio, never get to see or hear a record being made, and only experience the finished product. Until now, you had no way of learning about the enormous complexity of the recording process and this limits appreciation of the music. We can't hope to explain all of the complexity, but we hope to give you some insight to the musical forces at work and have a good time in the process. We arranged with Hoyt Axton to record one of his sessions at Capitol. While the musicians play and the producer and engineer record the music, we're recording them at work. Come on, Rosmini, time's tapes, rolling's money is everything. What's the name of this thing? This is... Uh... Oh, never mind. Take one. You didn't give me enough time, man. My brain goes chunky, chunky. Let's time is money. Go. Let's go. Take one. 29, 33, 54. Hup, hup, hup. <laughs> <laughs> How about take two? Okay. 
The conversation you just heard between Hoyt Axton and Dick Rosmini, our producer, is not uncommon. The phrase, time is money, has become a cliché within the recording industry, for a very good reason. Time literally is money. This was a small session, but it cost us $8 a minute. And without an element of humor, obviously one runs the risk of the creative process being stifled by time pressure. The essence of music as a creative art used to be individual effort. However, the medium of expression of contemporary musical art is records, and that is altogether a different matter. The production of a recording is an enormously complex undertaking, involving months of effort from dozens of persons with an incredible amount of equipment. The goal of all of this technology and effort is to present the art of the musicians at its best. In so doing, the recording process has greatly expanded the art. It also has become an integral part of it. The distinction between technology and art has become very diffuse. It's difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. The artist has become an engineer, and the engineer an artist. The role of the producer is that of catalyst, and we'll discuss his work with the engineer later on. He begins working with the artist, though, long before the actual recording session, determining which tunes to record and how to arrange them, instruments needed and which musicians should play them. During the session, he serves as a non-playing member of the group. Since he doesn't have to play, his entire attention is concentrated on listening critically. There will be many conferences between him and the musicians about what they're doing on each tune. Okay, um, we'll try making another one. It's a little uh, formless at the start, uh, mostly because the piano entrance and Bruce's entrance don't make a positive thing. It's not that they're too busy or not busy enough. It's just that they sounded a little tentative, like you were trying to get in on a live show, you know, and you didn't quite know where it was. Uh, you know, the piano doesn't respond, so I have a tendency to keep my foot on the on the pedal. Does that screw you guys up? Not so far, man. The bottom end rasp has been really nice. It's just that when you play little tinkly leads, it's a little little dull. Yeah. Uh, but it could be the piano. It's not a chippering, no, you know. I don't have any chops. I'll play a little bit more. I'll put some echo on it just to see what it does for later. You won't hear it now, but... Uh, Okay. Yeah. David Jackson on piano plays on many recording sessions, and he knows from past experience that the sound he hears while playing is not always the sound the microphones hear. Microphones, like loudspeakers, have their own special sound, and deciding which mics to use and where to place them and how many to use, usually takes the first hour of a standard three-hour recording session. There were two microphones on the piano, but five on the drums, for example. It took half an hour to get the sound we wanted from those microphones at $8 a minute. Our drummer is Mike Bots of Bread, who was nice enough to take the time from his touring schedule to play for us on this session. Next, we should, I think, proceed to the bass. Arnie, would you play by yourself a little bit? What you're gonna play on the, on the part? It's possible to record electric instruments two ways, with a microphone or by plugging the instrument into the recording console. Arnie Moore is playing bass for us. Right now, he and Rosmini are trying to determine the best way to record the bass for this tune. Are those real new strings, Arnie? Yeah. The runner sound. Yeah, a little bottom to that. Not much, just a little. That's better. I gotta, I'm not using my back pickup at all. This is my back pickup. That's better. But I can still hear the drums. Let's just use the direct one. This is the first of three phases that a recording session usually proceeds through before the final take is made. First, the engineer and producer must establish microphone locations for each instrument in order to get the sound they want. This is done while the musicians are tuning up and working out the approach they're going to take to the tune. The second phase is rehearsal. During this period, the musicians will try various approaches to the tune. They'll change tempo, harmonic structure, and so forth. The producer and engineers will set recording levels and check the overall sound. The last phase is actually recording, and this begins with take one. Right now, the only microphone left to check is the vocal. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Fellas, Hoy, can you try to stay just a bit more on mic? I don't think we're going to be able to keep this because there's a lot of leakage on it. 
You know, in other words, you're gonna have to, can you sing it again? Oh, well, yeah, sure, I can sing it. I'm not doing a vocal now anyway, man. I'd like you to sing it when we make the take. I mean, I'll leave into his guitar. Right? Yeah, I know, but I'm the point is, is somebody got to have something to follow. What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah. Sure Good idea, Richard. Let's we'll put it up. Even if it makes Golly. it necessary for you to redo, or we have to fight the battle of uh, where you sing, uh, you know, the little of your voice goes into the guitar mic as well. Well, you, hey, wait a minute, man. Are you, you want me to shoot for a vocal now? You don't kill yourself. It's just the idea is I'd like the guys to hear what you're doing because I think everybody plays better when they have a performance to relate to. Right, I agree with that. And if but it's I a good performance, there's no sense in throwing it away. Okay. Turn that, turn that, turn that, turn that. When Hoyt asked the producer whether or not he should try for a vocal while the band was playing, he illustrated the flexibility of the modern recording process. Very few tunes are recorded complete in one session, or even with one group of players. Usually only the rhythm section records together, and the solos and vocals are added days or weeks later. This is done through a process known as overdubbing, and you'll find a complete explanation of this in the booklet inside the album cover. I will keep quiet for a while so that you can concentrate on the session. The band will continue to rehearse the tune and they'll work out alternative musical concepts and arrangements until everyone feels comfortable with the music. Michael, I hear you saying something out there, but I don't pick you up at all. You know, I'd just like to run it a few more times. Yeah, okay. Uh, Michael wants to rehearse it a couple more times, so why don't you guys just do that? That's Langhorn for you once you get in tune. not really that slow, Hoyt. Uh, give yourself a little more time to get used to it, uh, okay. in the sense that make your decision about whether it's too slow or too fast after you've gone on for a while. If it begins to feel boring, so you're probably right, but you're only going about 20 seconds on it. It sounds strong because of the bass drum foot, you know. It would take, you know, like a whole range of tempos you could do this at. Okay. Arnie, can I, I see more, you. Can I have more kick in my, my headphones? Want more kick drum in the phone? Yeah. This is right. Right. Uh, Michael, right there on that one, we go through the whole tune, and and that, uh, I think that that's the first time that there are four. Yeah, four. And the lyric is, "Might keep your fantastic ball." Fantastic would be the key word on the fun, on the fourth. Uh, if we could see, if we could see Michael, we could think that you right on. On the left, I'll go. In there. Give us a little time. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do that. Let's see. No, I wasn't gonna. That's what it 
that's what we used to do. When the foot drum is exactly together with the bass note, it gives a solid foundation to the tune that can't be gotten any other way. The drummer and bass player will work on this for a while to get it just right. Well, Richard, the way you guys came in before is that Hoyt started to sing and he stayed by himself for a while. Can we, that would be nice if you could do that. What? Uh, just a bass drum foot to uh, make some time. Are you serious, man? That's not what we did last time. Have you no. never done that? Something, that piano laid out last time is what happened. And the guitar came in kind of mushy. No, mushy? And that's what made it uh, feel, uh, that gave you that, that feeling. No, oh, that feeling. Oh, yeah. That's that feeling. David All right. Was Captain America. I'll just, lay, I'll just lay out and do it just like no. you just did. Yeah, you, you know, that keep them around. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Ready? All right, let's do it. Captain America, take four. Okay. Hey, hey, here we go. Simple, simple, simple. Hey, come on. Ready? One, two, three, four. Let's try five. What's the matter? Didn't you like him? He was good. Is that what you wanted? Well, I would, you know, that's not what I asked for, but it sounded nice. All right. Take six. Play it by ear, fellas. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three, four. And not together. Take seven. Okay. One, two, three, four. Now the group is putting it all together. Listen to how the bass and foot drum combine to provide a basic structure for the tune. The piano part is becoming more rhythmic and less melodic as David shifts his point of view from lead to support. What lead guitar there is, is being provided by Bruce Langhorn. All of these musicians are good enough to play solo, but they know the job they have today is to accompany a singer, not to make a piece of their own. getting closer to a cohesive statement, and this is the first take that the producer recorded all the way through. However, since no one can play and listen critically at the same time, they don't know for sure how well they're doing. They can only tell by listening to the tape. As a matter of fact, all final value judgments by everyone involved in record production are made by listening to the tape since that represents the final product. This is why monitor loudspeakers play such a vital role in record production. Let's listen for a while. Okay. Let's do another. Can we 
see where we are. Why don't we do another Let's one? Let's see where we are. Let's listen to it. I haven't heard it yet. Uh, that one's uh, uh, at a position where you can find out something about the tune we can talk about. It's pretty close. Uh, if you want to do another one, we can do another one. No, let's, you're right. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, out there or in here? Here. Outside. That odd sound you hear is the tape rewinding in the control room so that we can play it back for the musicians out in the studio. Everyone is taking a break and listening to the total performance. There will be a general critique, and probably several persons will suggest alternatives. These will be tried, and after a few dry runs, we'll be ready to record again. All right, wait a second. Let's, let's, let's get this organized here, man. All right, on the tag, Michael? Michael? Spot? On the tag, you know? Yeah. Let's, let's plan something out here. Like, you know, we'll go, uh, you know... Eight or twelve or whatever it feels like. Uh, I mean, it should be for that on the boogaloo, and then go into that other thing. You know. Let's make one. Okay, I just let me remind you, fellas, that the front of the tune ain't as fierce as the back of the tune. And remember, oh we got to go back to the front of the tune now. Can you do a Latin version of this song? <laughs> Time is money, time is money. Enough life, hey, life's a serious hey. business. Let's, Your life. Let's just get on with the business. Enough life. nonsense. Hey, Dick, I hope you edit out all the dumb things we say, too. I know you're going to edit out the dumb things you say. We're going to leave all the dumb things that you say in there because you're going to have dumb pictures of you on the centerfold and all other kinds of things like that. Oh, pictures, pictures. I love pictures. I got one from the first Peter, Paul, and Mary hey, session I keep forgetting on, to hey, give you. Hey, it's 12 years old. Make you, make you faint and cry. Oh, no, I'm not that old. You guys <laughs> act like you're on uppers or something. Let's get on with the song. <laughs> All right. It's rolling. Okay, it's rolling. This is Captain America, take 14. And that's the one we used. The recording session is over, and the musicians have gone home, but a lot of work remains before we reach the finished stereo master. Turn the record over, and we'll show you what happens next. During the recording session, we made no attempt at musical balance. Each microphone went to a separate track on our 16-track tape recorder, and Hugh Davies, our engineer, concentrated on getting as much signal as possible on each track without overloading. This would help us keep the background noise very low. Now those 16 tracks must be altered and blended to give us the total performance we want. Usually the artist takes part in this process, but Hoyt had to leave for London just after the session to make a new record over there. Sometimes the artist acts as his own producer, but this is rare and very difficult because of the need for objective critical listening. At this point, almost anything is possible with our tune. We've used only 11 of our available 16 tracks. The remaining five can be used at any time for any instruments we choose. We added two acoustic guitar parts and the announcer, me, which totaled 14 tracks. Now here is our raw musical material. We'll play it for you one track at a time so that you can hear what we'll be working with. There were five microphones on the drum set. Here is a microphone we used for the kick drum. And here is the microphone for the snare drum. Here's the microphone and the tom-toms. We suspended a pair of microphones directly over the drum set. These would pick up the sound of the entire set, but primarily that of the cymbals. 
We had one on the left and one on the right. This would help us give a better stereo perspective in the finished record. Now here's the two of them together. We overdubbed two acoustic guitar parts. Notice that there are no other instruments in the background at all. That's because the guitarist was in the studio alone. He listened to the tape of the original session on headphones and played along while we recorded his guitar. After he completed that take, the same guitarist then overdubbed a second guitar part. Now here's both parts together. You can see how one works against the other one. We didn't use a microphone on the electric bass. Instead, we plugged it directly into the recording console. And here's the sound we got. There were two microphones on the piano, both suspended inside the piano. One was used for low strings and one for high strings. Here's a sound from the microphone on the high strings. And here's the microphone sound from the low strings. Here they are both together. White Axton also played acoustical guitar on the session, but the microphone we used picked up his vocal as well as the rest of the band, and we weren't able to use the track in the final mix. Here's the sound we got. Now contrast that with the sound from the electric guitar, which was plugged, again, directly into the console. Now here's the vocal from Hoyt Axton. Rain, doesn't that kind of tend to put a strain on the gears grinding in your brain? And I might come around again. Yes, I might come around again. Those are the raw materials that we have to work with, but each track can be changed quite a bit by all of the controls that we have on the mixing console. For example, equalization, often called EQ, means adding boost or cut at selected frequencies. It's a complex set of tone controls on each channel. Let's go back to track one and we'll show you what we can do with EQ. Some of the changes in sound that we'll show you in the next few minutes may be very subtle, depending on what speakers you hear this record on. That's the major criterion for a studio monitor, the ability to show detail and subtlety. Remember, all the value judgments the producer makes about the sound depend on the monitor speakers. What he hears from them will determine the final sound of the record. Now, on the kick drum, we can boost or cut 12 dB at 40 hertz. Here's the boost. And here's the cut. Obviously, those changes are much too gross we actually used a minus 4 dB at 40 hertz. This was done so that the drum wouldn't interfere with the bass part when we add that. We also added 9 dB at 1500 hertz to give the kick drum presence. Now we'll set the bass sound. We'll add 4 dB at 100 Hz to give a sense of low notes pitched below the kick drum. And we'll add 6 dB at 1500 Hz to add presence.
There, that's better. Now hear the bass and kick drum together after they've been equalized. Now this is what they sounded like together before they were equalized. Equalization is used on almost every record produced today. The other thing that's used on almost every record is echo. We'll show you the effect of echo on the lead singer. We'll begin with none at all and go through the full range of the chamber. Captain America, I took your Super Bowl. Might bring it back in the early morning. Might not bring it at all. Might bring you nothing at all. Might keep your good Super Bowl. Yes, I might keep your fantastic fun. Obviously, that change was too large for anything other than special effect. Let's show you the effect of echo on the piano. We'll begin with the chamber wide open and gradually decrease it to something that sounds good. There are almost an infinite number of subtle changes and alterations that can be made to each track. We've showed you EQ and Echo. There are many other effects that we didn't have time to show. By the time the producer and engineer have made basic decisions about all of these, they've played the tune probably a hundred times and know each track intimately. Then the final mixdown process can begin. Part of this is deciding where to place each instrument in the stereo perspective. Each track has a balance control called a pan pipe. We'll begin our mix down with both acoustic guitar tracks all the way on the left, and then we'll use the pan pots to split them left and right. Now we'll bring in the kick drum in the center. And with it, the bass part. The snare drum will go left of center and the tom-toms right of center to complete our stereo perspective. and the overhead drums will go left and right with the guitars. Now the piano will fill in melody left and right of center to complement the percussion. High piano to the right, and low piano to the left. Now we have a percussion instrument at each perspective point. Left, right, center, left of center, right of center. And a tuned instrument in each location as well. The structure of the tune is built and the electric guitar will provide a spotlight for the vocal. And here's the vocal.
This has been a very short sketch of a process that can require days or weeks of concentrated effort. After all of these weeks were over, here's Hoyt Axton singing Captain America as we finally produced it. Captain America, married to your color TV. Someone come along, steal your lady, and just might take her with me. Just might take her with me. Stole your train. You ran to the runway. Same body took your plane. Left you standing out in the rain. Doesn't that kind of tend to put a strain on the gears grinding in your brain? I might come around again Captain America I took your Super Bowl Might bring it back in the early like other art forms, is a means of articulating concepts, viewpoints, and emotions that are not easily verbalized. It would be appropriate to close this album with an expression of our feelings about music, but Hoyt says it better than we can. Brother David Jackson, won't you play the key? Some 
might have fine wine and joy to the world now. All oh, the boys and girls now, joy to the fishes in the deep blue seas, joy to you and me. If I were the king of the world, tell you what I'd like to do. Throw away the cars and the bars and the walls and make sweet love to you. Just make sweet love to you. Sing and joy to the world now. All the boys and girls now. Joy to the fishes and the Son of a gun, I'm a straight shooting son of a gun. Singing joy to the world. Oh, my boys and girls, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea. Joy to you and me. Ha, ha, ha.